It's Wednesday, December 18th. Welcome to Market Foolery. I'm Chris Hill. Joining me in studio today from Motley Fool One, Jason Moser, and from Fool.com, Taylor Muckerman. One week to Christmas, gents. It's almost here. <laughs> Can't believe it. Done all your shopping? For the most part, yes. Have you? Yeah, just waiting on get FedEx to deliver my Amazon you know what? packages. Just say, man, I hate this you. Is, just get out of this This is a guy who's neither married nor has children. Yeah. Easy for that you. is uh, no, I'm not done. Yeah, no. not even close. It <laughs> seems like we're kicking around ideas last night to try to figure the rest of the stuff out. I can imagine the children but, uh, thing would be pretty hard to tackle. All I'm saying is, <laughs> you know, it is because it moves so much faster now. You got to buy them like an iPad at age four. <laughs> just technology's taking over. I mean, bicycles almost cease to even, you know, make any sense. I, you know, that's wow, unfortunate. I, Amazon Prime is going to get a workout over oh, the next seven Yeah, days. I would imagine so. Amazon <laughs> Prime is... Uh... Uh, we're going to talk FedEx and their latest quarter. We're going to talk about the latest IPO, but let us start with Ford Motor. Shares of Ford down 8% this morning after announcing the company's business outlook for 2014. Ford said that profits and margins will be crimped in the coming years because of the recession in Europe and costs associated with vehicle launches... Really, down 8% now. I last saw it was only down 5 Well, you got to check right oh, before you come in the studio. <laughs> you, you know, we trade by the minute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're day traders. We're closet day traders. In all seriousness, how, how bad is this? Because on the one hand, I don't want to discount <clears throat> the cost of vehicle launches. That said, my gut reaction when I saw the blaming Europe recession, I just thought, I'm sorry, is it 2010 again? <laughs> I thought Europe was turning the corner. Mm, well, I think maybe a lot, a lot of that pessimism has already flowed through for the most part, and it's it's not as much of a drag maybe as it was before. But like you saw GM, for example, they're uh, pulling the Chevy name out of out of Europe, and that was you know to the tune of about a billion dollars there. And lucky for them, they sold off Ally, which sort of helped make that a wash. Uh, but no, I, I think with Ford, just just as with any of these automakers, I mean, I think that. If conditions are good in one part of the world, they're not so good in another, and we're seeing that that dynamic, you know, play out more and more with these automakers as be, as as they are truly global companies. Um, it's interesting to me to see sort of the disparity here playing out with GM and Ford, uh, because now you look at GM, and GM's the one that has all these good headlines coming out. The news is great. They've got their CEO in place, yeah. sort of a vision in mind. And, and I, I think the headlines would have you believe that Ford is really kind of under the gun here and can't figure things out. And I, I don't think that's really the case. I mean, I think that uh, you know we know that Alan Mulally is going to be stepping down soon. And the leadership question, it, it, it's not firmly established yet, but I feel pretty comfortable in saying that CEO Mark Fields will be taking over the reins there. Um, and, and, you know, Ford is continuing to roll out new vehicles. And so I think that at the end of the day, that's what it all boils down to, is these companies making cars that people want. Um, and, and, and then the other thing to consider really, too, is that ever since we've seen sort of this recovery, uh, the unemployment picture has picked up a little bit, housing has picked up a little bit, and yes, people have spent more on cars. But that, too, is going to sort of play its way out as well. That's not like a perpetual uh, line up, so to speak. I mean, automobiles are cyclical. And so, at some point here, we're going to see that sort of level off. And, in, in, you know, Ford, GM, and, and their ilk are all going to be subject to that. Yeah, I mean, when you look at this company, I think, you know, maybe it's short-sighted on the markets to kind of put the stock down 8% on 2014 guidance. I think 2014, they're planning the most aggressive launch in company history, moving more and more towards their one Ford program with 23 new or highly refurbished uh, cars in, in the 2014 year. So, a lot of the costs that they're talking about, crimping their margins a little bit lower than they had expected, that's where that's coming from. So, when you look at it, they're, they're comparing to probably one of the best years ever in company history in 2013. So, it's a tough comp. And then you also look at them emerging with a stronger balance sheet. Uh, they're cutting their pension, like unfunded pension in half. And then also, they're reducing the cash that they're going to need over the next three years to pay for that by a billion dollars on their range, now down to one point one to two billion a year versus two to three. So they're gonna have extra cash to play with uh, for the next three years. And that overhang has been cut in half on their unfunded pension. So I think the company looks stronger. And if those vehicles that they're taking uh, to market in 2014 hit hit with the hit out of the park, I mean, who knows what's gonna happen in 2015 to 2020 on their decade plan. Yeah, they might be a little off on their mid-decade plan, but I think the long game here is looking pretty strong. One of the things we know that is coming in 2014 is probably in the first few months is an IPO by Chrysler. 
I we, thought you were going to say flying cars. <laughs> <laughs> we Dead. talk all the time about Ford and GM. To what extent, if any, is Chrysler on Ford's radar? And Part of what I'm thinking here is back when Facebook was still a private company, I, I said at the time, one of the entities that has to be excited about Facebook's IPO is Google, because now Facebook will have to operate on a level playing field in terms of the information that they share publicly. Mm -hmm. I just assume that Ford and GM, among other things, are looking forward to Chrysler being a public company, just so that they have more information about a competitor available to them. I would th I would think they would look at that as an opportunity to shine. I mean, I, I think that when you look at the three companies, um, the cars that they produce and the market shares that they hold, uh, Chrysler you know, comes in third. It seems virtually every time. I, I was giving Chrysler. Is it the uh, Discover card? <laughs> I, I was actually giving them a little credit, a little a Ron Burgundy bump, so to speak. But uh, after reading it, it was Carl Quintanilla tweeted out the New York Times review of the Anchorman 2, and it yeah. was botch, botch, botch. Botchy, botch, botch. Botchy, botch, botch. botch. Yeah, so <laughs> apparently that wasn't that good. So maybe I'm taking my Ron Burgundy bump back. Um, I, I, I think that Chrysler is still faced with that fundamental issue of, of not being able to put out uh, vehicles is number one that that resonate with consumers, and then really having a brand that resonates with the consumers as well. So it was, however, the CEO of Auto Nation who gave Will Ferrell and the Ron Burgundy commercials for Dodge Durango credit for the spike in Dodge Durango sales last month. And they didn't have to pay them for it, so they saved some yeah. money on all that marketing, which was pretty nice. Let's move on to FedEx. Second quarter profit was up 14 percent, but it missed some analyst expectations. I'm a little confused, Taylor, because the stock is basically flat. It seemed like a pretty decent quarter in terms of profit. They also raised their uh, guidance for full year earnings growth. Was it just yet another case of this was a good quarter, not a great quarter? Yeah, it seems like that. A couple things worried me right off the bat, but overall, I think that uh, it's it's got a lot to look forward to. A couple of those things, you know, their FedEx Express, as redundant as that is, um, it did help boost operating income and margins, but volumes were down internationally and domestic on that, and that's their highest producing uh, segment. So you look at the ground area, which is uh, significantly smaller than their FedEx Express. Growing volume-wise, so maybe people are buying for cheaper options of shipping. Uh, that's yet to be seen. But one of the bright spots, I think, is that Cyber Monday fell in the third quarter of this year, so that's not even reflected. And by all accounts, Cyber Monday blew it out of the water. Right. Uh, you look at some people saying that maybe a 20% increase year over year in cyber sales. And what shocked me was that a third of that came from smartphones or tablets. So those are growing in importance in shopping. Uh, but we'll be interesting to see how the third quarter performs based on the, that incremental sales data from Cyber Monday. And then also people are rolling out sales throughout that entire week online. So even past Monday might have a higher sales uh, year over year. So we're going to continue to watch that. As far as the higher guidance, I think a lot of that's coming on the EPS side from increased share buyback this quarter and expected over the next couple quarters as well. So I don't know if that's coming from the performance side of things or if just uh, some financial engineering there. To the Cyber Monday numbers, at the time, I think it was actually on Cyber Monday, or maybe it was the just a few days before, FedEx's CEO was talking about how they thought Cyber Monday was going to be about 10% higher than a year ago. If it really was 20% higher, that could be... That's that, huge. That, that could be a blowout quarter that we're talking about three months from now. Well, it could be, but it also depends on, again, what you know, what kind of shipping options consumers are using. Because I think the one, the big headwind FedEx is facing is, is that, you know, consumers are opting for the cheaper, slower uh, shipping. And, and so, that, I think, is one thing that's sort of crimping FedEx's profitability. But the other thing is that, you know, we talk about UPS and FedEx and lump them in that same sort of category. And with the advent of online retail and, and how much it has to grow, isn't that going to benefit these companies? And yes, it will, but we also have to remember it's not a secret. I mean, it doesn't take much of a leap to go from point A to point B there and understanding that those companies are going to be shipping a lot of stuff. So then you see, uh, you know, the other companies that are responsible for those orders and Amazon, I'm looking directly at, at you, uh, you know, they're the ones that are trying to figure out ways to sort of take the cost out of that shipping. You know, the, that's one of the cost that's one of the costs we pay attention to with Amazon quarter in and quarter out is is shipping as a percentage of total sales because over time they're really trying to bring that down to really justify 
you know, the cost of Amazon Prime and the fact that they can get things uh, to people so quickly. And so you see the the thing like we saw in 60 Minutes with the Amazon drones. And I, you know, I was even reading about FedEx. Uh, they have. I would call it a rather bold plan. I mean, they want to they want to basically replace their air fleet uh, potentially with unmanned aircraft to fly those things all around the country, uh, sort of in that drone uh, sort of flavor. But I mean, again, I think that you're looking at these companies. the The biggest challenge they're faced with is trying to figure out a way to whittle away that cost structure because because these shipping companies are just inherently very capital intensive as well as being subject to fluctuating fuel costs. I hear what you're saying about consumers going for the lowest option in terms of what they're going to pay for shipping. But we started this podcast today talking about how you and I, and we're not the only ones, schlubs like us, are going to be paying up for shipping over the next seven days. I'm not I, paying a thing. I are, yeah, I'm, I'm not paying a prime, thing. Man. I mean, everything is already taken care of there. And so, and that, I'm, but, I, I'm just, I know me. I know my history <laughs> with Christmas shopping. I know that at some point in the next few days, I'm going to click a button that says, no, it's got to be here. I'm going to pay Next more. day, not free. Two and I, I don't price. doubt that I don't doubt that I will have at least one of those occasions. It's it's most certain to happen. But I mean, by the same token, uh, companies are also fo- the, the purveyors of these goods are are covering a lot of that shipping bill. Uh, Under Armour, I think, is a great example. It's one where I had ordered a few things uh, for gifts this year, and Under Armour was offering free shipping. Uh, and then they broke it down into it was free shipping, period, with no real time constraint. Or if you had orders of $150 more, it's going to be free two-day shipping. But any which way you cut it, you weren't paying for shipping with, with Under Armour at all. Um, and, and you know, fortunately for me, I was able to order some things and, and get them shipped to me uh, immediately. But that was another great example of, of me not having to pay that shipping cost. Uh, the companies are trying to bear the brunt of that because they know that free shipping is the key item for consumers and shopping online. That's the first thing they're looking for, beyond even a deal. It's almost like now, if you're if you're selling stuff online, the gall you have to charge shipping costs. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe you. how dare you do that. To wrap up on FedEx, when you look at this stock, does it look cheap to you? Obviously, it's not really moving today. Mm-hmm. It's sort of fluctuating one percentage point above or below zero. Does it look fairly valued? What do you think when you look at this stock? I think it might be a little too pricey for me at the moment. It's had a good run. Uh, a lot of good data has come out about uh, consumer shopping and shipping over the last year. So I think both this stock and UPS, while they are probably a good long-term play, I think it might be a little too expensive for my own taste right now at the moment. I will be interested to see maybe the data usage spike for Verizon and AT&T on Cyber Monday, given the fact that a third of all the sales supposedly came from tablets and smartphones. People weren't connected to Wi-Fi. It probably ran over a little bit. <laughs> uh, before we get to our final story, yesterday I mentioned the Stitcher Awards uh, for various podcasts. Late yesterday, I got the very surprising and uh, very good news uh, from iTunes, the nice people at iTunes, uh, who have come out with their best of 2013 list. This is not done by voting. This is the iTunes editorial team. And on the list of the best of 2013 on iTunes was our daily market wrap video show, Investor Beat. Yay! Which again, uh, it, it was it was a wonderful surprise. Yeah, that's <laughs> it was a great awesome. surprise to get that email. Uh, so thank you to the people at iTunes. Thank you to you guys and everyone, uh, all the analysts who participate on that show, and of course Heather Horton, who is our our guru behind the equipment, making it all work. But um, it's it's been uh, it has been very much a team effort here at the Motley Fool. We have core values as a company. One of them is collaboration. I feel like. All the programming we do, Market Foolery, Motley Fool Money, Investor Beat, are very much uh, living examples of collaboration because it takes a lot of people at various points to all bring it together. So, so, so I remember when we were back, just really kind of putting all that stuff together. Mac I mean, is not behind the glass anymore here, but he's obviously a part of that as well. Um, and just <laughs> the first few weeks of trying to really get that format hammered out exactly how we liked it, it just seems like it came together. Very quickly, and we turned it into, I think, a very efficient and effective process, and very repeatable. I mean, it, yeah. as someone who you know gets to take a part in it, it's it's a it's a pleasure to be able to do. You know, it's not like a chore every day. Um, and and you're you're right, the, the collaboration that's behind it all. I mean, all of the people who have something have something to do with it. It's it's 
pretty amazing. Uh, check out Investor Beat on iTunes, also on Fool.com every day at 5 p.m. Uh, again, it's our daily market wrap show. Just w- one little behind the scenes thing uh, to, to that point, because <laughs> you're right, it is an efficient, tight show. We we bang out sort of the headlines mm-hmm. of the day. It's different from market foolery because we're, among other things, we're touching on more stocks. We're, we're hitting eight to 10 stocks and giving a quick take on each one. But a year ago this time, when we were putting the show together, holy cow, was that a painful process. Because we, would, we had all these ideas for different segments. We would film them, and some of them we would watch them and say, wow, that's terrible. we got to weed that out. That's terrible. And, and even worse, it would be, wow, that's a good segment. I don't think we can do that every yeah. day. So anyway, And uh, it's video, so you get to see our faces rather than yeah. just hear our voices. Yeah, That's an added bonus. Uh, or not. <laughs> uh, but again, thank you to the people at iTunes. It's uh, it's very much an honor to be on that list. It has been a good year for the movie industry. It has been a good year for IPOs. That is probably at least part of the reason why AMC Entertainment went public today. Shares up about 9-10% off the IPO. It's not Noodles & Company. <laughs> it's not Noodles & Company. And when you look at Look, it's the leading movie theater chain in the country. They've got nearly 5,000 screens across 340 movie theaters across the country. And yet, it's hard for me to get excited about this stock. I am a movie fan. I like going to the movies. I'm actually part of the AMC Stubbs reward program where you you know you pay a, pay a small annual fee and you so you got the letter about offering you the, and we the actually got, pretty cool. we got some email from listeners who forwarded this email that they got saying what is this yeah a, a couple of weeks ago AMC sent out an email to anyone who was part of their rewards program saying hey we're going public and here's an opportunity to get on on shares yeah that's that's not something you really see every day I mean most of the time the only real chance you have in getting in on an IPO is if you know um, or have an account with you know one of the underwriting banks involved, but um, I, I mean this you know I I'm a movie guy. I mean I like going to the movies. I, I think we probably make it to you know three or so a year, and, and they're typically kid related movies. But I mean if anything, you have to love the fact that the stock is only up eight or nine percent. It seems like at least the underwriters price the IPO about right, so that's good. But I mean I, I think to your point about not being so enthusiastic about the overall sort of business. As an investment, I think there's good reason for that. I mean, if you look at its its competitor in the space, Regal, uh, you know, I mean, that sales have been relatively flat over the past five years. I mean, sales are up about eight percent. That's not annualized. I mean, that's eight percent in five years. Um, it's it's tough to continue to raise prices on those movie tickets, uh, and and then you also have the service dynamic of it as well, and having to offer more and more uh, to keep people coming in the doors. Um, it's not it's not the the biggest margin business in the world. Uh, I think the interesting thing about this is actually who owns a stake in this company because even after the IPO, uh, this this Chinese developer uh, developer Wanda Group is is actually going to own eighty percent of the company, and so their chairman Wang Jianlin, who just actually was was announced as Forbes Asia's two thousand and thirteen Businessman of the Year. He's he's I believe the richest man in China if, if I'm not mistaken. He's and, having and a good day. A, <laughs> yeah, they run a portfolio. Uh, Wanda Group runs a portfolio with about 48 billion dollars in assets. So with you know uh, AMC at somewhere in the neighborhood of two or even less, it, it's it's a small it's a drop in the bucket there. But he has a big interest in this industry. I mean he's just signed a big deal to bring uh, hundreds of IMAX screens up uh, to China over the course of the next decade. He really wants to turn uh, China apparently into into the next. Big Hollywood movie destination. So I think that for AMC, the entity, it's great that they have that ownership. I'm not sure as an investment, it's one that I'd really be all that interested in because for sure, no matter what, you're you're getting in bed with Wanda Group at the end of the day with this one. Well, and our colleague Rick Minaris wrote an article on Fool.com today, among other things, saying that he's more excited about the prospect of buying shares of IMAX right. than he is yeah. AMC. Is there a particular movie you're looking forward to this holiday season? I always try and get to at least one over yep. the holidays. What a, yeah, I'm anything? sure I'll go to one with the family. Um, I was looking forward to Anchorman 2 until I just heard the botchy botch botch. <laughs> I don't let those things dictate. <laughs> no, I, I want to still, still go, still go see it. it. Yeah. I, I saw some good reviews, yeah. too. Yeah. So, yeah. So. yeah, Anchorman 1 was one of my favorites of all time when it came out. Um, so that's on the list. And just being in, in finance, Wolves of Wall Street kind of strikes. The Wolf a, of Wall Street. Yeah, that kind of 
strikes my interest. Um, don't really believe in the way that he led his life and that it's being <laughs> glorified, but it could be an interesting thing to check out. It was the 80s. Yeah, fair enough. It was the 80s. What Different about you, time? Uh, so, well, we already saw Frozen, and you know, give that one two thumbs up. I think that, for me, Wolf of Wall Street is definitely one that I'd like to go see, and, and I'm I kind of have that up there with American Hustle. I think American Hustle is another oh, yeah, one that yeah. I would get a kick out of seeing. I feel like they have really a pretty strong cast there uh, that could could tell a really fun story. So I think those are the two that are up on my list. Like you, a lot of the movies I get to in the theater are movies with my kids. G-rated. So I'm looking forward to getting out to an adult movie with my wife. Wait a minute, let's clarify that. <laughs> a, a, a movie that's not G-rated and animated. Um, I'm a little torn just because there are Movies and in particular performances that are just getting these rave reviews. Rob, uh, Robert Redford and All Is Lost, and you know, Twelve Years a Slave, and people are like this person is a lock to get Best Actor, and I don't doubt that. But those movies sound exhausting, right. uh, just or they they just sound like it, it's hard for me to be like, honey, I got a babysitter, let's go see Twelve Years a Slave. As good as that movie is, it was like three hours. And 15 uh, minutes. Whereas uh, Saving me. Mr. Banks with Tom Hanks and Emma Thompson, the movie about oh, yeah, Walt yeah, yeah. Disney. The man oh, right. yeah, trying to convince the author of Mary Poppins to sell uh, her story to Walt Disney, so he can make a movie about it. That's that's gotten a lot of good early buzz. So I think I think that's the one I'm going to go. If see. I'm going to a theater, I want it to be a movie that has a theater uh, experience. I don't yeah. want to see something that I might feel the same if I'm on my couch. Oh watching. right. I want the surround sound and the the big screen to really have full effect. All right, Jason Moser, Taylor Markerman, guys, thanks for being here. Thank you. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. That's it for this edition of Market Foolery. The show is mixed by Ann Henry. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.